Continuing my read through of the Bible, I now come to the book of Judges. Now, Judges, whatever else you want to say about it, and I'll say plenty by the time this review is done, Judges is a very interesting read. And that may be worth highlighting because a number of the books of the Bible I've read so far have not been so interesting. I was, uh, I admit, I was looking forward to rereading the Bible and starting this project and remembering all the stories uh, I had learned in Sunday school and how interesting all these stories were. Uh, and that memory had perhaps overshadowed the memory of just what a slog a lot of the Old Testament is. So Genesis was interesting. Exodus was half interesting, but then the second half of Exodus was just, just descriptions of uh, tabernacles and priestly garments and wasn't very interesting at all. Leviticus was all about laws and priestly rituals. Uh, Numbers was half narrative, but half laws. And then Deuteronomy was all laws again. Joshua started out interesting, but then the second half of Joshua was just a geography lesson where it was just listing towns and boundaries. But with Judges, we are back to the good stuff. So this is all narrative, uh, and it's bizarre. The stories often um, have characters doing stuff that don't make a lot of sense or seem to be missing scenes or something like that. But... Uh, it's interesting, and, and it's all narrative. So I really enjoyed uh, rereading Judges. Now, uh, there's a lot to comment on here, but um, maybe just starting off with the overview of this. So I, I believe the current view uh, is that uh, the historical narrative, um, starting with Joshua and going through the end of Second Kings, was put together sometime in the Persian exile uh, or shortly after the Persian exile by uh, an editor who's been called the Deuteronomistic Historian uh, or I guess the, the D source sometimes. So this, this is the um, so named I think because uh, the laws in Deuteronomy are associated with him and also the polemic which comes up at the end of Deuteronomy and the polemic which is reiterated at the end of Joshua, which is, uh, if you follow Yahweh, you will prosper. If you follow other gods, you're going to get conquered by your enemies and you're going to suffer. And again, it's worth remembering that this Deuteronomistic historian is writing all this from the perspective of, of after the fall of Jerusalem. So he's trying to make sense of how did God let this happen and retroactively retrofitting uh, that perspective back onto the sources that he has. So uh, the book of Judges uh, has a number of, I guess you would call them folk tales in here, uh, that uh, my understanding is the Deuteronomistic historian has edited these folk tales in and tried to fit them to his polemic. The polemic being, follow Yahweh, you will prosper. If you don't follow Yahweh, uh, your enemies will overtake you. Uh, which leads to kind of a cyclical pattern, which is repeated all throughout the Deuteronomistic history, which is uh, Israel falls away from God. They, stop, they start worshiping false gods. Their enemies conquer them, they repent and cry out for deliverance, and God raises up a hero to deliver them. Um, and, yeah, that, that's the, the basic narrative framework of this. Although, maybe as we'll see in a bit, uh, some of the stories uh, don't seem to have been adjusted a little bit for this. Um, actually, I was going to talk about that later, but that's the problem with doing this unscripted. Here, here I find myself talking about it now. Okay, I might, might as well get into this, uh, as long as I'm talking about this. So, uh, yeah, Gideon, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, so Gideon 
has a nickname, uh, which is Jurabel. Uh, how do you pronounce that? Jurabal. Uh, and according to uh, the narrative of Judges, he gets this nickname because he cut down the altar of Baal. The, um, you know, because he, he's, uh, Baal is a false god and Gideon serves Yahweh. So they, they uh, the townspeople come to, to punish him for cutting down the altar of Baal. And his father answers, uh, would you plead for, for Baal? Would you champion his cause? Uh, let anyone who pleads for Baal be put to death before dawn. If he is a god, let him plead for himself, now that Gideon has destroyed his altar. So that day, Gideon was given the name Jeroboam because they said, Baal must plead against him, seeing that he has destroyed his altar. Now, there's a footnote here. So we go to the footnote at the bottom of the Jerusalem Bible, and it says, Folk derivation. The name, in fact, has the opposite sense. Baal defend him. So I, I believe the implication here is that this character, uh, as he was passed down through the folklore, had the name Jeroboam, which means Baal defends him, which means he was, he, he, the original story was he, he was actually uh, a worshiper of Baal. And, and one of the, um, this, is, this is a story of one of Baal's followers, a part of the Baal mythology, uh, if you will. Uh, but then because this story has fallen into the hands of the Deuteronomistic historian who wants to cement the narrative that the followers of Baal are bad and the followers of Yahweh are good, uh, he has to rearrange this to come up with a folk etymology uh, or folk derivation of why uh, the hero has a name Jeroboam. Now, uh, Admittedly, you, you can see I'm uh, doing a little bit of supposition on my part. That's not all spelled out here. But I went. I was intrigued enough by this that I went to Wikipedia to look up Gideon. Uh, and uh, Wikipedia uh, repeated that theory um, so that I, I do seem to be on the right track of that about that. Now, um, as with so much of biblical studies... We'll probably never know for sure, but that that is at least one theory. Is that uh, in the original story? This was a follower of Baal because he had the name uh, Baal defends him, and then we we get this um, keep the name but give this little folk derivation to show that he's actually an opponent of Baal. So yeah, the 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 w Wikipedia indicates a lot of these stories come from various different sources. Uh, you know, a lot of folk stories. Um, Wikipedia actually, while you're on the story of Gideon, uh, has a, you, you remember the story of Gideon from Sunday school, maybe Gideon was the one who, who, uh, had the fleece and he, he took, uh, what, 300 men to the camp of Midian and they defeated them because they blew their trumpets in the middle of the night. Um, but, uh. There's, aside from that story that you might be familiar with in Sunday school, there's uh, a lot more that goes on. So Gideon is pursuing the Midianites, and he finds out that they um, have killed his brothers. Uh, and... Uh, Where is it? Yeah. The men you killed at Tabor, what were they like? They answered, they look like you. Every one of them carried himself like the son of a king. Gideon replied, they were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As Yahweh lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Uh, but because he had, they had killed his brothers, he, he orders them killed. Uh, Wikipedia also indicates that there's a theory that this was actually the original core story. Uh, Gideon's brothers were killed. He's pursuing the Midianites out of an act of vengeance. So it's like a revenge story. And then uh, the other stuff, the stuff that we're familiar with from Sunday school about the, the 300 men attacking in the middle of the night, that's the stuff that got added, added on later. So 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. Interesting researching a little bit about this and trying to figure out uh, where all this comes from and what the theories are. Now, having said that, I'm, I'm going to come right out now and admit that I have not researched this thoroughly. I've gone down a few different rabbit holes of things that interested me, but I've not looked up everything. There, there are any number of stories here that I, I read, but that did not go to Wikipedia, did not look up. So, um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to make any apologies for that. This, this project has always been a casual reading of the Bible, not, not a scholarly reading. So to the, um, to the extent I, find, I found out interesting things on Wikipedia or the Internet, I'll, I'll share that as I go along. Um, but this, this is just going to be my reporting on my casual reading of, uh, of, of this book. Um, right. Where was I? What, what was I talking about? Okay, I, I guess the point is, the point is, uh, a, a lot of different folk stories here, uh, apparently some of which have been rearranged from their original uh, origins to, to fit this polemic. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible also gives some indications where different narratives have been spliced together. If I remember, I'll talk about that. But maybe let me just back way up and talk about my history with the book of Judges, because I think this might sound familiar to a number of you. Maybe some of you have had this history. So uh, a number of these stories I first heard in Sunday school, as I'm sure you had too. Uh, the story of Ehud. The story of Deborah uh, and uh, Barak and Jael. The uh, story of Gideon, like I said. Uh, and, of course, the story of um, Samson. And, uh, yeah. And Samson, of course, was one of my favorite stories, as it is a favorite story of all uh, young boys, I would imagine. Uh Plenty of violence and uh, fighting in the Samson story. Um, so I, I, I like these stories and I remember them being told by my Sunday school teachers and by my Christian school teachers uh, in a very enthralling way. Um, I, I used to love Bible class when I was young, listening to these stories and listening to these stories at, at Sunday school. Uh, and I think I mentioned this in the video I made when I started this whole rereading the Bible project. But I, I have memories of being, I don't know, about in first or second grade and uh, trying to get my mom to retell the Bible stories to me at night before bed, you know, for the bedtime stories. Uh, and my mom was, was not very good at it. I mean, to, to be fair to my mom, most people aren't. Uh, that takes talent to, to be a good storyteller for young children. Um, so my mom would just take out the Bible and just read the stories from the Bible. And I would say, no, that's... The thing is, when you actually read these stories directly from the Bible, they're told in a way that's very... Yeah, how would you want to say this? I guess boring would be the simplest way to tell it. Not, not very narratively engaging. Uh, so, um, th that, I guess that was my first encounter with, with the, the actual book of the Bible is, is realizing just how much my Sunday school teachers and my Christian school teachers, uh, had added in narrative gloss when they were retelling these stories. Because if you actually read them from the Bible, they're, they're very bare bones. And the characters are doing things that don't make any sense and are not explained uh, as it is in the text. And uh, that's the, the style of most of the Old Testament narrative. Uh, now, Christine Hayes, in her uh, lectures at Yale University on the Old Testament, talks about a book. I forgot to remind myself of who the author is. Um, but The Art of Biblical Narrative. 
uh, in which uh, th this author examines um, the structure of the, the narrative prose in the Bible and dissects it. And I presumably, if you read the book, he might talk about why. Um, Christine Hayes, in her, in her lectures, I don't think talks so much about why, but she does analyze there's a distinct style going on in which the the so much of what happened is not explained and the details are left up to a lot of interpretation. Um, and it, I mean, it's worth pointing out maybe that even though the Bible is very old, this is not uniformly the um, style of ancient texts. Uh, Herodotus or Homer with the Iliad and the Odyssey give tons of extra narrative details uh, much, much similar to reading a, a modern story. But the Bible is not like that. The Bible is um, like somebody has given you the outline of a story and you have to fill in all the details yourself. And as I said in my review of numbers, uh, in a way that can be kind of annoying, and I, I remember feeling frustrated um, about that as, as a young kid when I was when my mom was reading the Bible to me, when I was first trying to read the Bible myself, trying to find all these stories that I knew from Sunday school and finding that the actual text of the Bible was, was not nearly as narratively engaging as the way my Sunday school teachers had made it. But, uh, but on the other hand, and, and again, this comes back to the point I made before uh, in a previous video, uh, it does kind of, the, the, the fact that you have to do so much interpretation makes it, uh, invites you to play with the text. Um, one person can give it one interpretation, another person can give another interpretation. Uh, it, it's kind of like a, a choose your own story. Like here are the bare bones of the plot. Now you have to actually make your own story uh, on top of this. What are the character motivations? Why do they do what they do? What are the missing scenes here? Uh, you have to come up with everything. And there has been no shortage of interpretations of this over the years and retelling and, you know, the, the Bible stories for children type books in which, in which they try and make sense of these and, and tell them as a story. So I, I guess the glass is half full way to look at this is uh, if you want a more detailed story or something that... Um, meets the modern expectations of a story, that's out there. Um, but you're not going to find it in the Bible. You're just going to find a, a lot of stuff that's just... Well, it, it's interesting. Um, but it, it does not meet the modern expectations of how a story should be told. But then the other thing... Uh, the other memory I, I have, and again, this is growing up in the Christian school system, is around 6th and 7th grade, uh, we actually began doing a thorough study of the Bible, going through chapter by chapter, and we got to all the stuff that they never teach you in Sunday school, because uh, although there are some very recognizable stories in the book of Judges that are commonly retold in Sunday school, Samson being, Samson, I think, and maybe Gideon and Deborah being the most famous among them. There's also a lot of other stuff, bizarre stuff and uh, stuff that's not appropriate for young children, I guess would be the polite way to say that. Uh, so that that's why it does not pop up in, in Sunday schools. So uh, yeah, there's the, the story of Gideon, uh, for example, has a little bizarre epilogue here where he's pursuing the Midianites and taking his vengeance against them. Uh, and then at the very end, Gideon sets up an altar uh, and becomes an idolater. Um, and again, this is a classic example of what I was talking about earlier. So we, we, we've, we've had it set up where Gideon is a partisan of the cult of Yahweh. So Gideon is knocking down the uh, altars of Baal. He's, he's establishing the proper worship of Yahweh. That's the whole reason 
Uh, he gets called to deliver his people. Uh, and then, after they're defeated, uh, well, let me just read this. This is a perfect illustration of what I was just talking about. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your sons and your grandsons, because you rescued us from the power of Midian. But Gideon answered them, It is not I who shall rule over you, nor my son. Yahweh must be your Lord. But Gideon went on, Let me make one request of you. Let every man give me one of the rings out of the spoils. For the vanquished army had golden rings, because they were Ishmaelites. Um... They had golden rings because they were Ishmaelites. Okay, yep, yep. Just add that to the list of things that uh, don't make sense or are not explained. Uh, they answered gladly. So he spread out his cloak, and on it they threw every man of them a ring taken from the spoils. The weight of the golden rings he had asked for reached 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the croissants and the, sorry, Crescents, not croissants. The earrings and the purple garments worn by the kings of Idiom, Midian, blah, 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 blah. Uh, of all this, Gideon made an ephod and put it in his own city of Oprah. After him, all Israel prostituted themselves to it, and it was a snare for Gideon and his family. So the ephod, if we go to the footnote here, is apparently some sort of religious emblem, uh, which became the object, object of idolatrous worship. So, uh, yeah, this is just a classic example of what I was talking about earlier. Gideon goes from being the hero of Yahweh to all of a sudden uh, setting up an, an idol. And, and uh, all of a sudden Israel is worshiping the idol instead of Yahweh. So, uh, why? Why? You, you know, um, it, it doesn't make any sense, but um, th there's, there's, I'm sure, any number of interpretations to be made here, or there's uh, any number of stories to be written which could examine how Gideon's opinion had changed over time, how he became disillusioned with Yahweh, or maybe how he just became tired, or it, you, you could, you could make up any explanation you want here, and you could, you could make your own retelling of this, and I'm Without even looking, I'm sure people have, right? There's got to be all these different retellings of this uh, in Christian tradition and Jewish tradition over the centuries, over the, the 2,500 years that, that these texts have been around. Um, but as it stands on the page, it's just like, what? Why? What, what, what happened? And, and, and it's just like that all the way through. Um, and then, yeah, here, here's another thing that doesn't really get mentioned in Sunday school, is that Gideon's son, uh, Abimelech, uh, becomes a tyrant. And then there's this whole thing of the reign of Abimelech. So, uh, yeah, a few things, maybe. Uh, I, I was looking on Wikipedia ages ago uh, about the kings of Israel, just, I don't know, one of those Wikipedia wormholes you go down. And I expected them to say, like, Saul was the first king of Israel. But Wikipedia, at least at the time, had Ab Ablimelech mentioned as the first king of Israel. And I was like, oh, yeah. Because I, I remember studying that story when I was in sixth and seventh grade about how Ab Ablimelech was declared king of Israel. I'm like, oh, yeah. Saul wasn't the first king of Israel. Uh, Abimelech was technically the first king of Israel, according to these stories. Although the, the footnotes um, in the Jerusalem Bible uh, give give a little bit of a... Where is it? A, a little bit of a context here that I was never aware of. Uh, they said he was king over Shechem, and a few Israelite clans, not all of Israel. Now that's in the footnotes. In the actual text, it, it repeatedly refers to him as the king of Israel. Uh, Abimelech, by the way, this is another interesting little detail I, I learned from Wikipedia. Abimelech means my father is king, uh, and it was the name in the Hebrew Bible for all the Philistine kings. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, like just like the Egyptians had the pharaohs, 
the uh, Philistines had the Ablimelechs. That, uh, that was all, what all the Philistine kings were named. But, but here it refers to the son of Gideon. Uh, and yeah, he becomes a little tyrant and there's a whole revolt about him and he, he a little civil war here. Um, and then there's Jephthah. Am I pronouncing that right? So th there's a couple interesting things about Jephthah here. And this again, this is another story I remember studying uh, in Christian schools. I don't think it comes up in Sunday school quite so often because, well, because of a, a reason we'll get to in a moment. But Jephthah was, um, he was an, another um, judge of Israel, but he, he was um, like a, the, the bandit hero. He, he uh, had been an outlaw um, with a bunch of thieves who used to go raiding with him. Uh, my Christian school teachers made a big deal about how this shows that God can redeem uh, unlikely characters, which is a, a repeated theme throughout the Bible. So I, I remember this story from uh, my Christian school days. Um, what I had forgotten is just how anticlimactic this is. So the, there's the oppression by the Ammonites. Uh, they, the Israelites negotiate with Jephthah to give up his banditry and come with them. Jephthah um, gives a, a long letter uh, with the Ammonites, or a little bit of back and forth in which they recount their history. So this is coming from the book of Numbers, I, I believe. This back and forth there. But then the actual battle uh, is uh, just described in a couple different, in a couple lines, and that was it. And I thought to myself, I... Yeah, it's funny how you misremember things from, from being a kid. I, I remembered the battles as being like much bigger part of the story. Uh, same, same with the story of Gideon. So, uh, same with all of these, really. Most of the battles are just done away with in a couple lines. Um, and I guess, yeah, uh, w when these stories are being retold in Sunday school or by your Christian school teachers, they maybe make the battle into the more of a you know, bigger deal, m milk the climax a little bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, in... Reading these stories, it's just a couple lines. But yeah, then the, the other thing uh, about Jephthah is uh, Jephthah made a vow to Yahweh. If you deliver the Ammonites into my hands, then the first person to meet me from the door of my house uh, when I return from fighting the Ammonites shall belong to Yahweh and I shall offer him up as a holocaust. So a uh, holocaust... Uh, in the Jerusalem Bible is uh, their way of translating uh, when uh, an animal is burned completely to God. So it, 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 you, you have like a cow or a lamb or something and you put it on the altar and the whole thing gets burned up until there's nothing left. And uh, God uh, appears to accept that bargain because God gives him uh, a victory. Uh, and yeah, then, again, this is one of those things where it's a little bit, it's, it's not explained well. I remember uh, one of the kids in my Christian school uh, was recounting the story, and they said Jephthah just assumed it would be his dog who would be the first thing that would welcome him. And I think there's a very similar story in Greek mythology, uh, where somebody uh, says, I'm going to sacrifice the first thing that runs out to me. Uh, thinking it would be his dog. I forget what that story is, but as, if somebody knows what it is, let me know in the comments. There's a similar story in Greek mythology, right? Um, but here, he, he's very clearly saying the first person to meet me is going to get sacrificed to God. So uh, what is he thinking? Uh, it turns out to be his daughter, which absolutely horrifies him. But who did he think it was going to be? I, I guess he thought it was going to be his servant. Um, but, you know, there's going to be some sort of human sacrifice regardless. Uh, he didn't want to sacrifice his daughter. But um, so this is, uh, yeah, an, a, an example of human sacrifice uh, in 
service of the cult of Yahweh. Uh, as I've been discussing in these reviews, there have been a couple other possible examples of this. The, the women of Midian in Numbers, it, it appears, maybe depending on how you interpret the fact that they are to be given over to God, that some of them would be human sacrifices, although it's a little bit unclear. Uh, this this is, appears to be num another example of a human sacrifice to, to God. So uh, this is um, not surprisingly one of Christopher Hitchens' fam favorite examples to point out uh, about how uh, the morality in the Old Testament is um, not good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Christopher Hitchens' favorite point is that we don't learn our morals from the Bible because the Bible actually actually has pretty terrible morals. Um, it, it's funny. I, I remember I remember the story from uh, when I was uh, growing up in the Christian schools, uh, and you know the way it was always framed was uh, how stupid Jephthah for making that vow, um, and but I never thought I never thought until Christopher Hitchens pointed it out. That, oh yeah, I, I guess this is human sacrifice that goes to Yahweh. Um, yeah, it, it's, I don't know, it's, I don't want to get, <laughs> but like I always say, I, I don't want to get too Christopher Hitchens on this. I, I do want to talk about the stories as stories without uh, harping on too much of all the problematic parts in the Bible. But this is, this is a, a discussion you could have. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I had one friend who said, well, she wasn't actually sacrificed. Uh, she just uh, was not allowed to be married. So she, she was sacrificing her marriage, uh, which is why they bewailed, bewailed her virginity, because she was forever going to be a, a virgin. Um, this is not the usual interpretation of it, but uh, Wikipedia can, confirms that this has been an interpretation in both Jewish and some Jewish and some Christian circles since the 12th century. Uh, certainly the, the natural reading of the text is that it certainly sounds like somebody is getting, is, is dying, especially with the Jerusalem Bible using the word Holocaust. Um, but yeah, we'll, 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 we'll move on. Uh then there's uh, another one of those bizarre little stories, which is uh, a civil war. There's there's a number of little civil wars in the book of Judges where the tribes of Israel are, are fighting each other. So Ephraim is mad that they didn't get included in the victory. So they now they have a, a fight against Ephraim. Uh, and Ephraim is defeated, and they uh, station... Um, some men by the fords of Jordan, and the Ephraim uh, fugitives are trying to get across. So the men of Gilead said, are you an Ephraim, Ephraimite? And if he answered no, they said, then say Shibboleth. Uh, he would say Sibboleth, since he could not pronounce the word correctly. Uh, thereupon they seized and slaughtered him by the fields of the Jordan. So again, this isn't explained, although to be Fair to the text, I, I think it isn't explained in this particular instance because maybe it would have been obvious to the original readers of this. Um, the footnotes will usually explain it, although interestingly enough, the Jerusalem Bible does not. Yeah, footnotes in the Jerusalem Bible are interesting. Um, they're, they're often there when you don't expect them and they give interesting tidbits. But quite often when you need them, they're not there. Um, it, but yeah, in, in other editions of the Bible, I think the footnotes, other translations of the Bible, the footnotes will explain this. Uh, the, the people from Ephraim uh, couldn't pronounce the SH sound or it wasn't part of their dialect. So they said uh, Shibboleth, but they couldn't say the SH. So they would say Sibboleth uh, because of the, the, the dialectical difference. Which of course is where we get the word shibboleth from um, and today, which which uh, means, uh, I, I'm, you probably know what it means. Uh, it means like a, a word which is uh, meant to distinguish the in-group from the out-group. So like, you know, like a, a, maybe a special kind of slang that only uh, the cool kids know. 
so that becomes a shibboleth or uh, maybe a technical word that only people in the profession would know and that becomes a shibboleth it, it's it's a word the it's a word that if you can show that you know the word it shows that you're part of that in group um, there was a article years ago by, by an atheist who was reading through the Bible. Uh, and uh, he remarked when he uh, was talking about this passage, he said, you know, I, I, I knew what shibboleth means, like in the modern context. He said, I've even used it a few times myself. I had no idea that it originates from this Bible story. Uh, he said, this is why everybody should read the Bible, whether they're atheists or religious, just because so much of our cultural idiom comes from the Bible. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. That's part of the reason I'm rereading it now, even though I, I no longer consider myself a Christian, just because of all those cultural references. Um, yeah, and then the story of Samson. Uh, I don't know if there's anything much to say about Samson that hasn't already been said, uh, other than the fact that certainly, yeah, this this is one of my favorite stories as a kid. Um, one of the favorite stories of most young boys. Rereading it now, it strikes me as just so obvious that this is a folk tale. And uh, make, makes it very hard for me to, to, to put myself back in the mind of the community I grew up in, in which this is taken as literal historical truth. Um, I mean, just, yeah, everything about this is, is just kind of a typical strongman story with Hercules. This, the sorry, similar to Hercules, the part about how he's betrayed by Delilah and Delilah tries four different times for him to give up his secret. And each time he tells her and she does the thing that he, that's supposed to take away his strength. And then he keeps telling her. I mean, I, mean, I, I remember as a kid asking my Sunday school teachers and my parents, surely he knows she's going to try it when he, he tells her that his strength comes from his hair because she's tried every single other thing he's told her. So why in the fourth time does he tell her the truth? I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. But um, now reading this as like a folk tale, you, you can see that the, there's the, the natural patterns that you would expect in a folk tale where uh, there's, she, she tries once, he tells her a false thing, she tries again, he tells her a false thing, is just kind of building up uh, just just like the, these patterns are usually in a folk tale. Um, yeah. But uh, I, th th in fact, there are any number of things in this book of Judges, which now that I'm reading this from a perspective of an unbeliever, strike me as just so, so obvious that these are folk tales uh, that, that uh, have been incorporated um into this text but uh again i said i'm not gonna not gonna go all christopher hitchens mode on here i'm, I'm not gonna harp on all the problems I'm, I'm gonna try and hold myself back so uh and then we get to additions which have two rather bizarre stories the last sanctuary of micah and the sanctuary of dan i i believe in the translation i grew up in the niv this is translated as micah's I, micah's idols and then uh, the crime at Gibeah and the war against Benjamin. Now, uh, the Jerusalem Bible has these classified as editions, uh, part four editions. And uh, Wikipedia as well, in their breakdown of the structure of judges, just classifies them as editions. Wikipedia says the reason they're classified as editions is because they're not actually about a judge. So all the previous stories had been about a judge or strong man who had defeated uh, Israel's enemies. Now here we just have two editions where they're not really about a judge ri rising up to help Israel. They're just two rather bizarre stories at the end. 
uh, that take place roughly in the same time period. Although Wikipedia says there's some indication that perhaps maybe these would have taken place at the beginning of Judges instead of the end, and they're just placed you at the end because nobody knew where else to place them. Uh, and that's that's references to, I believe, uh, some of the various people in here. So, uh, for example, in the first story, the first story of the edition, Michael's Idols, there's a reference to a grandson of Moses. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yeah. So the Danites erected the carved image for their own use. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses. Uh, so uh, the, the grandson of Moses, so I guess this would, be, would have been during the beginning of the period of the judges. Now, interestingly enough, if you look this guy up on Wikipedia, this is another one of those rabbit holes I fell, fell down on. Uh, apparently, the original text reads, Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Manasseh not son of Moses, but there's uh, some sort of weird superscript on the original text which indicates that the original word was Moses and then they just changed it to Manasseh. Uh, I don't, sorry, yeah, they changed it to Manasseh. I don't quite understand how that works since, since I don't know ancient Hebrew. Um, and the idea was to change to, to save Moses some embarrassment because the, his grandson here has become an idolater. But uh, Gershom is also uh, is elsewhere referred to as a son of Moses. So apparently, this is actually the grandson of Moses. You can you can see here the Jerusalem Bible just translates it as Moses, doesn't even has a have a footnote here. Uh, and then the second story as well. Uh, the the rape of the concubine in the uh, civil war against Benjamin. At one point, they make reference to, uh, yeah, the the Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron. So the, the grandson of Aaron, I guess, and the grandson of Moses, which, which would date these stories. Um, yeah, so... If, if you're only familiar with these stories from Sunday school, you would never have heard these stories. Um, firstly, because it's really hard to know what the point of them is. Even my Christian school teachers had a little bit of trouble making, finding out what the point of them is. And the, the moralizing tone of the narrator is largely absent here. So uh, we, we don't get like he was punished because he disobeyed God or Yahweh blessed him or anything like that. It's just stuff that happens. And God in his judgment is largely removed from these stories. Uh, l largely. I mean, the, they are consulting with Yahweh when they were conquering Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. But even here, it's it's a little bit difficult to find out what Yahweh actually wants. So first one is a character named Micah. Now, for some reason in the Jerusalem Bible, they call this Micaiah in the first two times it's, it's mentioned. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Sorry, Micaiah. Uh, they do that the first time, I think the second time, and then they just go back to calling him Micah. In the NIV translation, which I grew up on, it was just Mike all the way through, if memory serves. Um, I, I almost, I suppose that's doing there. Is that a typo? Why does it change? I don't know. Um, now, th there's, there's a few, the Wikipedia entry on this story uh, says that perhaps there's a couple different stories that are being meshed together here. And apparently they've untangled, scholars have tried to untangle what the different sources are, which may help to explain why this is such a confused story. But his mother uh, had lost some shekels. Uh, Micah, or Micah has the shekels. So his mother makes an idol uh, and he installs the idol in his house and even gets a Levite to officiate for it. Now, this this is idolatry. Um, but what's weird is that, the, the again, the, the moralizing tone of the narrator never comes in here to condemn it as idolatry. 
Uh, it's just a story about him having Id the idols. And then the tribe of Dan comes across going in search of new territory. Now, this, this is an interesting thing, which I've come across a couple times in my research on this section, the migration of Dan. The tribe of Dan, I guess, was originally set up near the seaside next to uh, the Philistine territory, I believe next to, to Gaza, perhaps. Uh, and because, uh, that, I mean, that was the land that God had originally allotted to them. But uh, I guess because they had trouble securing it, uh, either the whole of Dan or a portion of Dan uh, uprooted and migrated to a part in the north of Israel. So, yeah, the, the migration of the tribe of Dan is, is taking place during this time. Um, and they go through Micah and they take his idols and his priests. Uh, and so... Um, Micah finds out uh, that they've taken his idols and his priests, and he, he runs after them. Uh, and they say, what is all this shouting about? And he answered, you have taken away the God I made for myself, and you have taken away the priest as well. You go on your way, and what is left for me? How can you ask me, what is this about? The Danites answered, let us hear no more from you, or men may lose their tempers and fall on you. You may bring about your own destruction and that of your household. So the Danites went on their way, and since Micah saw they were stronger, he turned and went home. And that's the end of it. So, like, I guess it was bad for him to make those idols, because... Um, although the, the interesting thing is, if, if you go back to the beginning, he says he's making these idols for Yahweh. Um, I, I actually had an interpretation of this text, which I arrived at, at myself back when I was in middle school. That perhaps the message of this text was uh, you you do something to serve God, and then that thing that you have decided to do becomes more important to you than God Himself. So, um, yeah, the, the the example I had in mind for my own life is uh, I had decided as as a good young Christian boy that uh, I needed to study two hours a night because um, you know this was. Uh, the Christian thing to do was to study hard and use the talents that God gave you and fulfill your potential and stuff like that. Um, but I became so obsessed with studying two hours every night. I, I tend to have a rather rigid personality. I, I don't know what undiagnosed disorder I have or whatever, but a uh, very rigid personality. Once I start doing something, I'm going to do it. Uh, and so that I would do those two hours every night, even if it was inconveniencing my family or uh, was, wasn't um, giving me time to help my brothers and sisters who might have needed help with their homework or with their chores or something like that. Just uh, I, I had to get those two hours of a night of studying done. Uh, and then I, I thought to myself, um, this was back in the days when I was still a believer, I thought, ah, this is just like Micah's Idols where he, he, he's setting something as a gift to Yahweh, but then the idol itself becomes uh, becomes the, the God itself, and he's forgotten all about the original Yahweh. Uh, and I, I actually gave that interpretation um, to my class when it was my turn to lead devotions. I, I chose this passage for devotions and, and gave that interpretation. Um. And I mention all that, I don't know, just to say that, is that the intended interpretation? I mean, what's going on here? My, my Christian school teachers never really, were never really able to make much sense of that, the story themselves. And then Micah gets left behind, and then we go to the tribe of Dan, uh, who's taking over Laish, I believe this is in northern Israel, uh, and this is interesting. It's interesting just coming out of Joshua and the conquest of Canaan, when the Israelites were commanded to kill all the inhabitants in the cities and it was framed as, as a good thing. Here, Dan does the exact same thing and it's framed as a bad thing. So, uh, taking with him that God that Micah had made and the priests who had served him, the Danites marched against Laish, against a peaceful and trusting people. They slaughtered all the inhabitants and set the town on fire. 
Uh, there was no one to help them because they were a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with the Aramean, sorry, Arameans. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the, according to Wikipedia, which again, I, I looked up on this, uh, there is some indication that the writers of this are trying to frame the tribe of Dan as, as just kind of um, being the bad guys, because during the time of the Northern Kingdom, the the tribe of, of Dan would, I guess, be a, a bit of a sanctuary for idolaters. Uh, so the prophets were uh, always railing against Dan. I, I the, Actually, the Wikipedia, the way it was phrased was a little bit ambiguous. I wasn't sure if it was a sanctuary for idolaters or sanctuary from idolaters. But it was it was it was. Some some sort of religious difference there that uh, made them want to frame the tribe of Dan as, as uh, slaughtering a peaceful, innocent people who were just minding their own business. It, it, but it's just a little bit strange uh, after coming from the, the conquest of Canaan in the book of Joshua, in which um, yeah, in which the the whole thing is about slaughtering people who are just minding their own business in their towns. Anyways, drink of water here. And then the next one. So this is the second bizarre little story that you would never hear in Sunday school and that you would, you would only encounter if you were uh, actually doing a study of, of the book of Judges. The Levite of Ephraim and his concubine. And you can see why this is not taught in Sunday school. So a Levite and his concubine... Uh, are traveling through the town of Benjamin. Uh, and we get a scene which is very similar to the, the scene uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah when, when Lot is, is there. Uh, the, 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 the townspeople surround him and they send, send out the man who has come into your house so we can abuse him. Um, The, the master of the house said to them, No, no, my brothers, I implore you, do not commit this crime. This man has become a guest. Do not commit such an infamy. Now, uh, interesting footnote here. Uh, the, the translators of the Jerusalem Bible want you to know it is the violation of the sacred, text, du sorry, sacred duty of hospitality which is considered a grave infamy. So in other words, uh, not the act of, of uh, homosexuality, which, which uh, I think is what's meant by abuse him. Um, and yeah, the, 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 a very similar dialogue occurred in Genesis with Lot and, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so they, he offers to send out his daughters, which is a virgin, which again is the same thing with Lot, the story of Lot. Uh, but uh, the men do not accept him. Um, but then, then the story is a little bit different from the story of Lot. The Levite took out his concubine and brought her out to them. And they had intercourse with her and outraged her all night till morning. When dawn was breaking, they let her go. Um, so, yeah, she gets gang raped all night. And that's, that's why you don't hear about this story in Sunday school. Uh, at daybreak, the girl came and fell on the threshold of her husband's host and stayed there till it was a full day. In the morning, her husband got up and opened the door of her house. He was coming out to continue his journey uh, when he saw the woman who had been his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, stand up, we must go. Okay, so that, that's a bit harsh after sending her out to get uh, abused all night, uh, outraged all night, and then that's the first words you say to her in the morning. Um, but again, again... As with everything else, uh, its text is is lacking in narrative details or explaining anyone's motivation. So it's uh, you know you you have to interpret this as you will. Uh, so then he cuts her up into twelve pieces and sends them out to the twelve tribes of Israel, which uh, encounters uh, which leads to the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, fighting against the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin is conquered and wiped out. Uh, and then there's two separate accounts of how wives are uh, obtained for the tribe of Benjamin after this. Um, footnote here that uh, 
several traditions are put together by an editor, hence repetitions will become, sorry, will be noticed. So, um, yeah, the, the, the footnotes here in indicating, yeah, and the footnotes here also indicating uh, that one account is inserted into the middle of another account. So that, that's, I don't know, that, that's interesting to see in the Jerusalem Bible. Again, the I grew up on the NIV Bible, which didn't uh, have notes about the, those textual insertions or variants. You know, variance is the wrong word, huh? Uh, but the, the 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 textual analysis uh, was was not part of my background, so it's it's interesting to read about. Okay, I sorry, I know this video has gone on for far too long. My my camera memory is just about filled up, so I'm going to get cut off in the next five minutes or so. But there's one more thing I want to talk about, which is um, one of the themes of these sections, which is uh, repeated a few times over. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did as he pleased. So we have these horrible stories about how uh, the, there's civil wars going on, there's lawlessness, there's gang rape, there's uh, innocent people are being slaughtered. Uh, and then it's, it's mentioned uh, several times in these last sections, the additions, uh, that there, there's no king and everyone is doing as they see fit. And so the obvious gloss on this is we really need a king because without a king, we just have anarchy and violence and um, everything's going uh, straight to hell in a handbasket without a king. Now, Christine Hayes in her lectures on this says that there's actually two different traditions which are being laid side by side here. There's a monarchical tradition and there's an anti-monarchical tradition. So uh, in that passage on Gideon, which I uh, just read, uh, and I'll, which I'll come back to look at again, uh, they want Gideon to be their king. And Gideon says, no, no, no. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Gideon answered, it is not I who shall rule over you, nor my son. Yahweh must be your Lord. So uh, we don't need a king, we've got God. And then, in fact, when they do get a king, Abl Ablimelech, so now we have a king, and he's just awful, and he causes all this uh, looting and pillaging and carnage. So, uh, you know, it, it's like, well, you, want a, you, you don't want a king. It's going to be just like Ablimelech. We've already tried that. Um, but then we, at the end of Judges, we get the, like this cry like, oh, we really do need a king. Um, and... I don't know. I, I, I find this interesting that the anti-monarchical tradition, as Christine Hayes puts it, I think uh, is most strong uh, or maybe gets its, its strongest statement if we skip ahead to 1 Samuel. And again, this is put together by the same editor. Uh, 1 Samuel 8, the disadvantages of a monarchy. So here I think we've got a really good statement of the anti-monarchical position. So the the... Israelites want a king. Samuel is trying to convince them they don't want a king. And he said, uh, these will be the rights of the king who is to reign over you. He will take your sons and assign them to his chariotry and cavalry, and they will run in front of his chariot. He will use them as leaders of thousands and leaders of 50. He will make them plow his plow land and harvest his harvest and make his weapons of war and the gear for his chariots. He will also take your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take uh, the best of your fields or your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his officials. Uh, he will take the best of your manservants and maidservants, your cattle and your donkeys, and make the, them work for him. He will tithe your flock, and you yourselves will become his slaves. So uh, this is, um, I guess if this comes from the anti-monarchical tradition, and I, I realize I have jumped ahead to 2 Samuel, but, but while we're on the topic, I, I mean, I, this is an interesting little bit of radicalism that we find here in ancient texts. It uh, reminds me of kind of studying uh, or re reading about, you know, the ancient Athenians where we have these, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, look at what he's saying about the ruling classes. I mean, right, right? this sounds like something Karl Marx would say about uh, all the, those kings or those rulers uh, – what do they ever do for the common people? They just take, take, take. They take your sons to be soldiers. They take your daughters to be maidservants. They take everything you have. And they don't give you any protection. They don't help you. Um, so it, it's 
Now, of course, that, as Christine Hayes says in her lectures, that is placed side by side with this view of if there's no king, it's going to be chaos and everyone's going to get gang raped in the streets and this, the uh, tribe of Benjamin is going to be uh, nearly wiped out and there's going to be all these civil wars and squabblings. So it's, it's an interesting um, ideological disposition where we have uh, both uh, what seems to be a what strikes me uh, even even today as being kind of a, a bit of a radical anti-ruling class uh, sentiment uh, against the power of kings and the coercion of of rulers uh, side by side with this um, with the, the these examples here of the kind of chaos that we can have without kings. Um, but certainly when you get to the last few sections of judges, you do get the impression, I think somebody else once said it, maybe it was Christian Hayes, that the, the violence is spiraling out of control in Israel and we need some sort of person to put the control back in. Even though, as I said earlier, apparently there's some evidence that these last two stories should chronologically occur earlier. I guess maybe they're placed here at the end specifically to give that impression. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Uh, like I said before, there are any number of rabbit holes I did not go down. I mean, I didn't even talk about Ehud. I didn't even talk about Deborah. I, you know, um, but uh, you can only talk about so much. And uh, the, lots, of, lots of interesting little rabbit holes that one could go down if one was to make a, a thorough study of judges. It's a frustrating, confusing, and fascinating little book.